News Leader. Good Wednesday evening. I'm Keely Medendorf. And I'm Tim McGonigal. Tonight, a nationwide search for two missing children has come to a gruesome end. Family members confirm that the remains found on Chad Daybell's rural property in Idaho are the bodies of his stepchildren. Here's CBS's Jonathan Vigliotti. The families of 8-year-old J.J. Vallo and 17-year-old Tylee Ryan saying in a joint statement, we are filled with unfathomable sadness that these two bright stars were stolen from us. Mr. Daybell, do you understand the allegations on both counts that have been brought against you? I do. Today, their stepfather, Chad Daybell, sat emotionless as the prosecutor laid out the grisly discovery that brought him to justice. We are aware that those remains are the remains of children. Police joined by the FBI unearthed those remains outside his home in Idaho and arrested him. He's charged with willfully destroying, altering and or concealing human remains. It's unclear how they died and how long the children were buried in Daybell's backyard. The two children disappeared shortly before their mother, Lori Vallow, married Daybell, a popular podcaster who believed in doomsday. Vallo has been in jail since March, charged with child abandonment. Daybell remained free until authorities closed in. The court is going to set bail in the amount of $1 million. Jonathan Vigliotti, CBS News. And a day after George Floyd was laid to rest, his grieving brother made an impassioned plea to Congress demanding police reform. He was part of a congressional hearing centered on sweeping legislation introduced to address systemic racism in policing. Meanwhile, in Minneapolis, the town where Floyd was killed, the police department has withdrawn from contract negotiations with the police union. Instead, outside advisors will be brought in to provide what the chief calls better transparency and more flexibility and re for reform. In other news around the nation, the U.S. government is seeking a record-breaking fine from a company accused of placing unwanted robocalls in states across the U.S. The Federal Communications Commission is seeking fines up to $225 million from Texas-based Rising Eagle, a company accused of making around a billion unwanted robocalls, spamming consumers in more than a half dozen states. The calls, which took place in the first half of 2019, allegedly attempted to sell fake short-term health insurance plans from major insurance carriers such as Aetna or Cigna. Now following the FCC fine, attorney generals for the seven states filed a lawsuit seeking an injunction against the company. According to Umail, a company that provides a service to block robocalls, there were 19.5 billion robocalls placed nationwide so far this year, equaling nearly 60 calls per person. The FCC estimates the cost of these calls to consumers is at least $3 billion per year from lost time alone, not including monetary losses to fraud. Well, today was a warmer day in the Treasure State and our Storm Tracker weather team is here to tell us more. Grant Garland joins us now and Grant, another beautiful day here in Big Sky Country. Yeah, it was. I mean, we were looking at temperatures right around the average for this time of year, which is good news. And we weren't really even seeing a really breezy day either, which is good news for us. 72, though, was the high for us. The record set back in 90 in 1918 when it was 96 degrees. So, yeah, it wasn't too bad, especially for for now versus back then. Elsewhere, we saw 76 degree temperatures in uh, Haver, 68 in Lewistown, 71 in Jordan. Now, looking outside, it looks beautiful, especially over up here in Great Falls, 52 degrees again, uh, 50 in Lewistown and 64 in Fort Benton. Elsewhere, seeing 55 degrees in Cutbank and 63 in Glasgow. And we aren't seeing really any major activity either outside. We are looking at just a few clouds rolling on by and it is uh, it is like expected to be a really nice night. Take for example, hell no, we're going to be looking at temperatures around uh, 50 degrees by 5 a.m. By 8 a.m., 55 degrees with mostly sunny skies and then it's going to warm up. But later in the show, we're going to talk about how warm we would can expect to be at the end of the work week. But for now, back to you guys. All right, thanks, Grant. Montana reporting eight new cases of coronavirus tonight, bringing the statewide total to 560. Six of the new cases are in Gallatin County, which now has 174 confirmed cases, 18 of which are active. The other two cases are in Bighorn County, which has 43 confirmed cases and 28 of them are active. Seven people are hospitalized statewide. Nearly 55,000 Montanans have been tested. On campus, Montana State University this morning released a massive document detailing a plan to help bring students back to campus this fall. MTN's Cody Boyer shows us how this will impact returning students. 
the safety and the health of our faculty, our staff, our students, that's our foremost concern. Aside from Montana Hall's hourly tolls and the construction of new classrooms, MSU has been quiet, but not for much longer. We have seen many changes come to our campus over the course of the past of this year so far. Bring in the roadmap to fall 2020. People returning to campus this fall, students included, are going to see a lot of adaptations to deal with mitigating the spread of COVID-19. Classes will be broken down into four learning models, in person, virtual, blended or a mix of the two and online. All the decisions that we're making are made in line with the best advice we can get from public health officials and even from the CDC. While masks won't be required, at least in most circumstances, they will be strongly recommended as social distancing will play a heavy role throughout the entire campus down to the doorknobs. As for the seating arrangements, as you can see by the stickers on each chair, that will be taken into effect as well. Differing schedules for where they're having their classes, a lengthened academic day that runs begins a little bit earlier, runs a little bit later to help accommodate some of those changes. And each person from staff to students will get a clean cat kit. And these are little uh, kits that we're giving out to folks that are going to contain hand sanitizer, disinfectant, some wipes and a mask. According to MSU's budget, the campus relies on about 45% of the tuition received from out of state students. So for that reason and more than 16,500 others, officials aim to make the return to campus a safe one the first time. We don't have all the answers. We want to have the flexibility and be adaptable enough to meet whatever demands come up. In Bozeman, Cody Boyer, MTN News. The fall semester is starting earlier than usual on August 17th. It ends on November 25th. And for news here at home, Cascade County Aging Services is working hard to ensure senior citizens have the essentials that they need. Director Kim Fieldshaft says their food delivery program, Meals on Wheels, has seen a dramatic increase since the pandemic started. Drivers delivered just over 1,800 meals. Uh, the, first, the last week of February and um, over 2,400 meals this last couple of weeks. So she feel Schaff says that they've moved seven people from aging services to Meals on Wheels to accommodate that big boost in deliveries. The department recently received funding from the CARES Act to help continue operations while at risk staff members stay at home. Now the $25,821 boost is only half of the total sum. Veal Schaff says they'll use the other half after July 1st for respite care, continued deliveries and offsetting food costs. Supplies are getting hard to find, so that money will help us reach out into the marketplace farther and get meat, um, vegetables. We're having trouble with chicken and pork right now, like everybody else is. So we're just having to make some alternatives. We're developing uh, plant-based meals, that kind of thing. Cascade County Aging Services delivers hot and cold meals to residents around the county five days a week and around holidays. And staying in Great Falls, one of Montana's most famous art museums will soon be back in business. The C.M. Russell Museum is turning their lights back on Thursday for their phased reopening. The C.M. Russell Museum store, as well as the Russell House and Studio, will reopen to the public. On June 25th, the entire museum complex will once again open. Dwayne Broughton, the director of art and philanthropy at the museum, says the museum's namesake was such a people person that the reopening is fitting. Well, nobody liked having visitors more than old Charlie Russell. And right along that vein, we're so eager to welcome people back here to, to celebrate the artist, the man, the, and the West. So. And as part of the reopening, parties larger than 10 will be required to enter the museum in a staggered format. Guided tours have been suspe uh, suspended through September. Sanitizing stations will be available throughout the museum, and staff will be wearing masks. We have more information on the museum reopening on our websites. Coming up next, preserving through the pandemic. How a small town rancher is making ends meet next. Welcome back. 
As we uh, all continue to recover from the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, we wanted to know what was important to some smaller communities in western Montana. So MTN's Lauren Heiser traveled northwest to talk with locals about dealing with a pandemic in rural Montana. With a population of just over 200 people, Dixon is one of Montana's smallest communities. The Dixon Mercantile has been called the heartbeat of town. Every Sunday, people gather there to observe the people passing through. When owner and operator Laura Shannon was faced with the decision of whether or not to temporarily close the doors, she said it was an easy decision to do so, especially when thinking of her regulars. There was one person she said she thought of immediately. I think everyone from here to who knows how far knows this man. Like he is just a legend. Jerry Hamel is a cattle rancher and a tribal member born in St. Ignatius who moved to Dixon at the age of four. Yeah, I remember Dixon was a boom town when I was little, you know. There was uh, mines going, there was logging, and there was, is there something going on in Dixon all the time? His parents bought the ranch in 1944 to keep him and his brother out of trouble. Now he says the ranch has become more than a home. Instead, the land provides him with a connection to something greater. God is right out here. You know, you don't have to gather with a whole bunch of people to be close to God. Two weeks before this interview, Jerry had a hip replacement. He's quickly getting back to work. At 84, he continues to run his ranch, only with the help of his ranch hand, Matthew Wyatt. He and many other livestock ranchers in rural Montana have had to deal with many changes over the past few months. Not only the closure of a beloved gathering place, the mercantile, but also a shift in the way that he and Wyatt conduct their business. Pandemic has caused, first of all, our restaurant sales to completely cater, but local demand has been, you know, just way beyond what we would have ever imagined before this year. Another rancher in town, Chris Sullivan and his family own and operate Montana Buffalo Gals, a bison meat producer. With schools closed, Molly Kate Sullivan saw every day how her father's business model had to change amid the pandemic. My dad has had to be more resourceful with contacting locals about getting our meat rather than meeting people in person and in town. It's just it's a little bit harder. I think all the ranchers locally have had to do it. There to help is Jerry's ranch hand, Matthew Wyatt. He and his wife plan to expand their vegetable farm to be a one-stop shop during the pandemic. Well, that's our goal, you know, and to have at least eggs, meat, vegetables. While the doors of the mercantile remain closed, the people of Dixon aren't allowing themselves to forget what makes their community so resilient. That's their ability to adapt and to never forget to take care of each other. In Dixon, Lauren Heiser, MTN News. The store on the Wyatt's Ranch will be open by the end of the month. You can find more information on how to contact Jerry, Matt, and the Montana Buffalo Gals at krtv.com. Well, we are 10 days away from summer, and boy, are we gonna be feeling those summer-like temperatures on Friday. Stay tuned for my uh, full forecast coming up after this break. Thanks. Welcome back, everyone. I hope that you have had a fantastic Wednesday. Happy hump day, everybody. We are one day closer to Friday. Take a look at this shot. I know I'm saying this every night, but I mean, it just continues just to uh, amaze me. The purples in with the blues. It just looks absolutely gorgeous. Uh, and temperatures, I'm standing in the way of them. 52 degrees, 7 mile per hour wind out of the southwest. It looks and it feels great outside. Uh, don't take my word for it. Just go ahead and step on out. You might need a light jacket. Helena, 64 degrees, Fort Benton, 64, down towards Lewistown, 50 degrees. Elsewhere, we are looking at 55 in Cup Bank, 56 in Haver. Well, head on out to Glasgow, just a tad bit warmer at 63. And for Helena, today's high did get up to around 73 which the average is around 74, so not too shabby there. The record was uh, back in 19, excuse me, 1956 when it was 94 degrees, also when as the world turns aired. Ask your grandma about it if you don't know. My grandma was more of a bolder, bold and the beautiful as well as young and the restless kind of gal, bless her. Outside, we aren't seeing really any uh, wind speeds too that 
are, you know, really any noteworthy. I mean, cut bank west wind at 12 miles an hour, but that's kindergarten stuff for us, right? I think so. Over the last few hours, we've been looking at really just a few clouds rolling on by, not seeing any uh, major concerns, and we're going to continue to see that really throughout the night, and it's all thanks to this high pressure here, but I do want you to notice the showers that are towards the west bit, because that's what we're going to start to see as we head into tomorrow. Also, note that cold front out in the ocean right now in the Pacific. That's going to be knocking on our door uh, on Friday evening. So here we go. Let's play it by ear. As we head throughout the night, the high pressure moves uh, towards the southern part of the state. Clouds start to build in as we head into the evening hours, though. We're going to start to see that flow come out of the uh, west, and we're going to look at a few showers kind of try and creep into the area. I don't think we're going to see any washout. I think that, if anything, we're going to see just an isolated shower or two, and I believe it will be mainly in the late evening into the early nighttime hours. As we head, though, throughout uh, Friday morning into Friday evening, we're going to start to see this cold front make its way closer towards our area, kicking up a few showers by around 930 for our friends in Kalispell. So that's what we're expected for the weekend. We're not seeing really any windy temp, any windy conditions tomorrow either. 10 to 20 mile per hour winds uh, will be what we expect overall. But on Friday, 90 degree temperatures, it's going to be hot. So heads up, make sure that if you do have any elders that don't have any air conditioning, that you just check on them and say, hey, what's going on? How are you? We are looking at cooler t uh, conditions as we look at the next week ahead. Six to 10 day outlook looks like we're going to be staying cooler than average, which I like. And we're also going to be looking at a better chance for showers too, which I'm also in for. I can I can deal with that. You can always follow me though on Facebook as well as like that. I'd love to be able to start connecting with you and get to build that bond. Meteorologist Grant Garland on Facebook as well as on Twitter and on Instagram. As we head throughout the night by 5 a.m. 46 degree temperatures, 8 a.m. 56 degrees with sunny to mostly sunny skies. We are looking at tomorrow being warm, 80 degrees, 90 though on Friday, Saturday jumping back down to 85. We will start to introduce a chance for a few showers on Sunday. It will be breezy too, but temperatures are going to be even cooler at 68 degrees before starting to warm back up on Monday at 72. Thanks, Grant. Coming up, controversy over CrossFit tonight. Why many are finding or ending their affiliation with the brand. That story's coming up next on the 10 o'clock team. Powered by the Montana Television Network. The 10 o'clock news continues on KRTV, Montana's news leader. Well, the minor league season hasn't officially been canceled yet, but teams are starting to acknowledge that there likely won't be pro baseball in Montana for the first time since World War II. Now, the Treasure State has a rich history of professional baseball dating back to 1892. Cascades' Steamboat Williams was the first Montana-born player to pitch in the major leagues, but the first Montana native to work in the major leagues was a mascot from Helena who made his debut in 1909. Brownie Burke, a bellhop at uh, a hotel in Mammoth Hot Springs, had been discovered by the owner of the Cincinnati Reds. And, and back in the day, um, mascots were little people. He ended up meeting presidents. He would deliver messages uh, to players when they were cut. In total, 23 Montana-born players reached the major leagues. Tom Wiley interviewed the co-authors of Montana Baseball History. For more stories, you can visit montanasports.com. Well, a local gym is rebranding after CrossFit's top official came under fire for recent comments made on social media. MTN's Isaiah Dunk has more from Great Falls. The sign says Big Sky CrossFit right now, but soon it will be Big Sky Core Sport. The Great Falls gym is one of thousands across the country that are severing affiliations with the CrossFit brand after founder and CEO Greg Glassman sent out multiple tweets on Sunday making light of the death of George Floyd and the ongoing Black Lives Matter protests. For Big Sky CrossFit owner Ryan Smith, the tweet sent him into disbelief. Smith had considered cutting ties with CrossFit before, so the decision was easy. And it was like pretty easy at that point to say, well, like, well we don't want to be a part of that. We, like, we won't, like, that's not what, who we're about. I mean, you know, we don't want to share that with others or have others basically have to be a part of that too. So we wanted to step away from that at that point in time. You know, we're village in that sense. Like, you know, something happens to one person, it's kind of happened to everybody. So, you know, you don't want to be the person that's determining what everybody else has to feel on the situation. Other gyms in Great Falls are planning similar action. CrossFit 406 owner Brooks Lindquist is in the process of rebranding his gym. 
Lindquist said Glassman had previously been disrespectful in Zoom calls and emails to affiliates. I think the model he built was very cool. I just think that he lacks leadership and the integrity that we need for someone in his position. And so over the last couple of years, you know, this has been something that has been developing. And yeah, this was kind of just the this, you know, straw that broke the camel's back, if you will. Lindquist said separating from the CrossFit brand may help his gym, since sometimes potential clients are turned off by the perceived intensity of CrossFit. Moving forward, coaches like Lindquist and Smith will have to get recertified, but the independents will allow gyms to keep CrossFit-style workouts while having the freedom to change as they see fit. The methodology of cross, CrossFit, um, that's still something that I, I feel strongly about um, and that I can continue to do because it's, it's still a method, basically, of how, you, how we train. So I'm keeping that. I'm, I'm going to add other stuff into it that I found that works for me and that I want to just basically further along other people as well. In Great Falls, Isaiah Dunk, MTN News. And Tuesday, CrossFit CEO Glassman announced that he would retire. Stick around. A final check of your forecast is next. No. Well, going throughout the day tomorrow, temperatures will be around 51 degrees to start us off. 76, though, by 1 p.m. and then by 7 p.m., 75 degrees. So make sure that uh, you have that air conditioning unit cranked up. I know I will. And we are going to be looking at temperatures really warming up to 90 on Friday. It is going to be a hot hot day, y'all. Well, it's time to round up your hunger. A new group is making its debut on social media. Great Falls Food Truck Roundup aims to help business owners post details about where they'll be operating through the summer months. One food truck owner told MTN News the new way of raising community support is huge in this age of uncertainty. I think a lot of them is, are like people just doing like small businesses and um, and I think especially now with like the coronavirus going on, like it's just huge for some people to have um, the support and I know sometimes like we'll go set up and people just kind of get weird about it and it's just it's so so encouraging when people are like super helpful and get in touch with us and just and of course you can find all of the details on where these food trucks will be uh, and where they'll be posting of course all that is on our websites right. great concept and especially yeah, a lot of, a lot of good foods media. a lot of good yeah. foods to go try grant you're new right. to the community so I'm telling you let's go. Food critic. you might actually find some like good brewed sweet tea you know that's not yeah. McDonald's so not okay. saying there's I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's all the time we have tonight at 10. Thanks so much for watching. Good night.